Today we have a treat. We thank God for the stamina of Deeper Fellowship family and those who are watching. Uh, and the reason I say today we have a treat is because literally you're going to get two messages today. Um, and the reason you're going to get two messages is because the Holy Spirit has some things he wants to say. And I'm excited about what it is that he's going to say. But we're going to take just a few minutes here um, to, to speak something the Lord has put on my heart. Uh, and then I'm excited uh, again for the word of the Lord. But we're going to take this moment here uh, to add some clarity uh, to some things here that I believe are pastorally important. And so uh, I thank God that you are hungry people, not only for the presence of God, but also for the word of the Lord. And so because of that, your stamina will be fine. I'm, I'm good, David. I, I want to uh, address a couple of things here uh, for us as a family that I think are vitally important uh, in this season. Uh, I'm going to go through some things, uh, some things relatively quickly, but my intention was to be really fast with this, to not uh, overburden us with the word. But what I'm uh, discovering is that um, as I begin to get into this, as I see the importance of the season, it's important important that we be uh, thorough and not just fast. Uh, and so I want to make sure that we do that. Although there will be some things I go through quickly and don't labor because I want us to, to be able to enjoy both words. Um, the reason I'm standing here, family, is because um, I self-evaluate all of the messages that I preach every time I preach, as well as valuing the feedback um, of our leaders and trusted friends. Um, and, and so that's a, that's a part of my process. I think all of us uh, here who preach, that's a part of our process. We, we want to ultimately please the Lord. Uh, at the same time, we ask the Lord, um, you know, we want to make sure that he's pleased. As you hear me even pray, I, I always pray and ask uh, that, that I please him. Uh, and so ultimately, that's the goal. And in part of that, and so doing in a, in a system of accountability, what I also do, in addition to asking the Lord, in addition to self-evaluation, uh, I also uh, talk to the elders as well as, as valuing the feedback of friends. I have one friend every single Sunday on the way home, I call and I say, what did you get? Uh, because ultimately, all of these things are good and necessary and right for us to do. Um, during my quiet time this week in evaluating what I said, said last week, I felt the need um, to add clarity to a particular point um, that I brought out last week. Um, I want to kind of remind us a little bit of, of what we talked about last week um, just by reading a particular scripture in the message um, in James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. We read this particular verse. My dear friends, if you know people who have wandered off from God's truth, don't write them off. Go after them. Get them back and you will have rescued precious lives from destruction and prevented an epidemic of wandering away from God. Now, when we preach that, um, the ultimate heart of the Father, the heart of the Father um, was absolutely uh, revealed, and the heart of the Father was that we not be a people who throw others away quickly. That's very important for us, and, and so we saw that even in the response of people uh, at the end, the, the, the Spirit of God was really uh, breathing on that part, brooding on that part, really um, moving in the hearts of people, um, that we wouldn't turn our back on the wanderer and enter into cancel culture, and so we talked about this idea that cancel is cancel. At the same time, um, I, I mentioned some things about uh, briefly about um, false prophets and things of that nature. Uh, and in so doing, um, this is the part that I want to lean in on and make sure that we have some clarity because ultimately there were there were two uh, thrusts or two streams that were flowing within the same message. And we leaned more into the heart of the father as it relates to going after the wanderer. But I did touch just briefly on the nature of prophecy and false prophets. Um, but I feel I feel strongly by the Spirit to make sure that that we lean into that a little bit more. And so, um, in 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 inviting us to not be a cancel culture, at the same time, this doesn't mean perver that we get to proverbially throw away caution to the wind or dismiss discernment or biblical truth or wisdom or insight. This is very important for us, family. And I, I want to do this here. Last week, I spent a brief moment talking about prophecy and what a false 
false prophet is. And I made a provocative statement that missing it doesn't make you false and accuracy doesn't make you a Christian or true, highlighting the fruit of the life found in Matthew 7. Um, that was an accurate statement. However, I, I want to protect you by giving you more insight than I did last week because I love you and I want to serve God and you well. I want to pastorally help us understand uh, the healthy rules of engagement so that we don't fall prey to the spirit of deception. Okay, you with me? I can't hear you, but I, I'm trusting that you're with me. This is what the scripture says to us, and, and this is vitally important in a season like this. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19 through 22 says this, Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. The way that reads in the message is this. Don't suppress the spirit and don't stifle those who have a word from the master. On the other hand, listen to this. Don't be gullible. Check out everything and keep only what's good. Throw out anything tainted with evil. All right, family, we are a house that embraces the prophetic and prophecy. We embrace the prophetic, we embrace prophecy, we embrace the miraculous, we embrace the gifts of the spirit. Um, that is what is considered to be, and that's obvious for, for any who's been connected to us. That is what's considered to be, or the terminology would be called being a continuationist, which is the belief that the spiritual gifts have continued since Acts and have not ceased. Those who don't believe that are called cessationists. Um, we are a house uh, that that is considered to be continuationist. Um, one of the, the interesting things about those who are cessationists is that a lot of times their argument is they have not seen or experienced either prophecy or the miraculous in any sort of significant way to cause them to believe or think that God is still moving in that way. You and I have a different testimony. We have a different testimony. We have walking miracles all around us. And so we are a house that does affirm and embrace prophecy. At the same time, I believe that in a time of hyper focus on prophecy and the accuracy or the lack thereof of prophecy, it's important to add clarity in this area considering we are a house that affirms it, particularly what is true and what is false. Because we are in a moment right now where it's very, very important that we be able to discern the difference. And I want to help you biblically. All right. Um, first John chapter four, uh, verse one says this, dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the spirit. You must test them to see if the spirit they have comes from God, for there are many false prophets in the world. Now, family, listen to me. I know that the scripture might be up. But they'll put the camera back on me in a second. I need you to hear me in this. Error is a spirit, not a mistake. I need you to hear that again. Error is a spirit, not a mistake. I want you to see it contextually now, okay? Um, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 again in the ESV. I'm going to read through verse 6. I want to give this to you contextually. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For there are many false prophets, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them for he who is in you is greater than he and he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Remember, error is a spirit, not a mistake. The spirit of error is an intentional attempt by Satan himself to lead the people of God astray by trying to appear righteous. 
2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to just run through these scriptures here because I don't want to take too much more time. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, uh, reads this way. Um, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants or ministers of righteousness. Their end will correspond with their deeds. Now, let me give you the full context of this, and there's a reason why I'm also giving context, because it's a part of one of my points in just a moment. Let me give you the full context of this. I'm going to choose to read this in the message because of the way that uh, Eugene Peterson just literally lays it out there uh, in modern day language that would make you be like, whoa, okay? So let me give you the full context of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting with verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting with verse 7, and the message says this. Now, Paul is talking. He says, I wonder... We're going to read through verse 15. I wonder, did I make a bad mistake in proclaiming God's message to you without asking for something in return, serving you free of charge so that you wouldn't be inconvenienced by me? It turns out that the other churches paid my way so that you could have a free ride. Not once in the time I lived among you did anyone lift a finger to help me out. My needs were always supplied by believers from Macedonia province. I was careful never to be a burden to you, and I never will be. You can count on it. With Christ as my witness, it's a point of honor with me, and I'm not going to keep quiet just to protect you from what the neighbors will think. It's not that I don't love you. God knows I do. I'm just trying to keep things open and honest between us. That becomes the context. Now, let's keep going here. And I'm not changing my position on this. I die before taking your money. I'm giving nobody grounds for lumping me in with those money-grubbing preachers vaunting themselves as something special. They are sorry bunch of pseudo-apostles, lying preachers, crooked workers posing as Christ's agents, but a sham to the core. And no wonder, Satan does it all the time, dressing up as a beautiful angel of light. So it shouldn't surprise us when his servants masquerade as servants of God, but they're not getting by with anything they'll pay for it in the end are you seeing this as your pastor hear me as your pastor I want to help you not fall prey to deception by giving you what I'm calling some of the rules of engagement for you to listen to especially in prophetic circles. This can also be used to discern who to listen to in teaching the word in general and help you identify both false prophets and false teachers. This is not an exhaustive list, but I pray that it will help us not to be deceived. The reason why I'm doing this is because when I talked to you last week about the fact that we don't want to get our seeds mixed up, that this is a season of compassion, not confrontation, I'm specifically talking about those who have fallen prey to deceive, to being deceived, not those who are the deceivers. Those who have fallen prey to being deceived, those who are wandering because they've been pulled away from the truth, we are to have compassion on them and go get them and not write them off. Those who are the purveyors of deception are to be confronted. I want you to see the difference. So when I'm talking to us as a family about having compassion, having the right seed, not just calling it a season of confrontation, but a season of compassion, specifically what I'm referring to is those who have been drawn away, not those who are doing the drawing away. It's very important for us to understand. So let me give you um, quickly um, what I call five rules of engagement. This is going to help us because we're not naive family. We know that as soon as you get off of this stream, you're going to be flipping to your favorite pastors all over the place on the Internet. And some of you are drawing uh, from from sources that are wonderful. And some of you are drawn from sources that I would not encourage you to draw from. So I at least want to help you without calling out names. All right. Um, one of the uh, rules of engagement I want to give you, number one, I, I, I mentioned this last week, um, out of Matthew chapter seven is the fruit of their life. 
the fruit of their life. This was the one area that we leaned in on as it relates to false prophets. We talked about the fruit of their life. So let's go through this quickly. Uh, number one, the fruit of their life. So this is kind of the rules of engagement. Can you see the fruit of their life? Matthew chapter seven, verse 15 says this, beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit. That is by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit so you can identify people by their actions. Family, hear me. Do not ignore the actions of people. Do not overlook the lifestyle of people. If the lifestyle is incongruent, do not listen. <laughs> now, probably some of your favorite people just, you're like, oh, but, but, but hear me. One of the rules of engagement is to examine the fruit. This is, this is important. I, I, I wrote some of these things down so that I wouldn't, wouldn't start going too, too long. Number two, number two, I, there's a whole lot more I could have said right there, but I'm going to just stop. Number two, um, here is one of the signs that you may be listening to a false prophet or a false teacher. Are you ready? Are they constantly missing it? Are they constantly missing it? Remember, I said error is not a mistake. It's a spirit. Are they constantly missing it? This is very important for us, family, because constantly missing it may be an indication that someone has not heard from the Lord. We, we, we see this quite some time. Um, I want to turn our attention to a couple of pastors in Jeremiah. Turn our attention to a couple of passages in Jeremiah, starting with Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 14. Let's read through this pretty quickly here. Then the Lord said, these prophets are telling lies in my name. I did not send them or tell them to speak. I did not give them any messages. They prophesy visions and revelations they have never seen or heard. They speak foolishness made up in their own lying hearts. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I will punish these lying prophets for they have spoken in my name, even though I never sent them. They say no war or famine will come, but they themselves themselves or die by war and famine. Pretty serious stuff. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 23. The scripture speaks for itself here, but I'm going to give some context to it. Jeremiah chapter 23, um, starting with verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 23, starting with verse 16. I'll read through 16 through 18. This is what the Lord of heaven's army says to his people. Do not listen to these prophets when they prophesy to you, filling you with futile hopes. They are making up everything they say. They do not speak for the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise my word, don't worry. The Lord says you will have peace. And those who stubbornly follow their own desires, they say, no harm will come your way. Have any of these prophets been in the Lord's presence or in, stood in the council to hear what he is really saying? Has one of them cared enough to listen? Jump down to verse 21. Jump down to verse 21. I have not sent these prophets, yet they run around claiming to speak for me. I have given them no message, yet they go on prophesying. If they had stood before me or stood in my council and listened to me, they would have spoken my words and they would have turned my people from their evil deeds. Jump down to verse 25 really quickly here. Verse 25. I have heard these prophets say, listen to the dream I had from God last night. And then they proceed to tell lies in my name. How long will this go on? If they are prophets, they are prophets of deceit, inventing everything they say. By telling these false dreams, they are trying to get my people to forget me just as their ancestors did by worshiping the idols of Baal. Let these false prophets tell their dreams, but let my true messengers faithfully proclaim my every word. There is a difference between straw and grain. Does not my word burn like fire, says the Lord? Is it not like a mighty hammer that smashes the rock to pieces? Therefore, says the Lord, I am against these prophets who steal messages from each other and claim they are from me. I'm against these smooth tongued prophets who say this prophecy is from the Lord. I'm against these false prophets, their imaginary dreams are flagrant lies that lead my people into sin. I did not sin or appoint them. They have no message at all for my people. I, the Lord, have spoken. If people are constantly missing it, perhaps you should not be drinking from that well. 
Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20 reads this way in the ESV. It says, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you context in just a moment. Um, but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. Now, <laughs> guys, a lot of us, a lot of people should be pretty happy that we don't live under that system because there'd be a whole lot of carnage. And if you say in your heart, how may we know that the word of the Lord or that the word that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet that has spoken it presumptuously, you need not be afraid of him. Now, I want to talk about this scripture for just a moment. I know I'm going a, a little bit long, but I want to talk about this for just a moment. In this context, a prophet could not contradict the law of the Lord or speak from his own heart or mind. To do so would make him a false prophet. Now, hear me, family. People tend to use passages like this one as a gotcha passage and say that anyone who misses it is automatically false. But we need to apply contextual understanding, also remembering that there are other factors that apply before concluding that someone is a false prophet. Contextually, this passage was to help them understand that if someone were to try to raise up and assume the position of prophet in the same manner of Moses, that if they spoke like Moses or as Moses or was to say that God has now anointed me to do it, God said, this is how you're going to know. If what they say doesn't happen, don't fear them. So there was a context for that. It wasn't just the aha, if you miss it, you're false. The context was if they try to raise up and say, I am now the Lord's anointed, then God says, okay, if I back what they say, listen to them. But if nothing happens, don't be afraid of them. So we need to understand contextually. Now, last week, I made a statement that is true, but I want to give you further context and clarity. I said missing it does not make you false, just like accuracy doesn't make you Christian or in this context safe. Let me let me show you something um, for those of you who are aspiring in the prophetic ministry, uh, things of that nature. I want to show you something uh, in First Samuel chapter 16. First Samuel chapter 16, I want to show you something, uh, particularly as it relates to how we how we move and operate prophetically in a safe vein. OK, um, as we know, the context of this is that Samuel uh, was mourning over the death uh, or mourning over the rejection of Saul. And, and God had spoken to him and said, I have a new king, someone who's after my own heart. And so Samuel is now going to the house of Jesse to anoint the new king. Uh, and I'm going to pick up here in verse one. It says, now the Lord said to Samuel, you have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there. Therefore, I have selected one of his sons to be my king. That's what God told him. God said, I've selected one of his sons to be my king. Verse six, when they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him, for the Lord does not see the things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, I want you to see this, family. The, the scripture speaks glowingly and amazingly about Samuel and the nature of his prophetic office, both as the last judge and the prophet who then takes the nation through a transition of systems. So the Bible speaks glowingly about Samuel, whose life was set up Part with a lifelong Nazarite vow to the Lord, and the scripture even says that none of his words fell to the ground. But I need you to hear what happens. God speaks to Samuel and says the next king is going to be at Jesse's house among his sons. When Samuel arrives, the prophet, the seer, looks at the first son and thinks, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But that's not who God was speaking to, which is to say that it's possible for us to miss it, even when we've heard from God, but I need you to see what happened with Samuel because I want to mature even those of you who are in the prophetic ministry because I believe that this is one of the things that happened in this last season which has caused a lot of confusion. Samuel thought to himself, but he did not say the first thing he thought. 
He did not say the first thing he thought. He, the first thing he thought was Eliab must be the one. But he waited for God to speak before he spoke. Samuel didn't say, Eliab, you're the king. The Bible says that he took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. He didn't say the first thing he thought. He didn't speak before allowing the Lord to give him clarity from his thoughts. There are so many times, family, where, where we, are, we are hearing from the prophetic community, I was sensing, I thought, I dreamed, and immediately they speak without allowing the Lord to process that thought. And this may be one of the reasons why we're seeing such confusion right now. Perhaps you did hear from God, but maybe you didn't wait long enough. You don't just say the first thing you think. You wait until God speaks to you. Understand that if Samuel had poured, poured out the flask and anointed Eliab, Eliab would have been king. But God had chosen David. Acts chapter 16. Remember, we said missing it doesn't make you false, just like accuracy doesn't make you true. Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, we see a girl who is seemingly speaking accurately, but the accuracy doesn't mean it was inspired by the Spirit. In Acts chapter 16, verse 16, this is what the Bible says. One day, as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. Uh, we know that, and, and the ESV and the others will tell you what that spirit is. It's a spirit of divination. We're going to talk about it in just a moment. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. This went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned around and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And instantly it left her. Let's go back to verse 17. Let's go back to verse 17 real quick. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God and they have come to tell you how to be saved. Family, is that not what they were and what they came to do? That's exactly what they were and what they came to do. She was accurate, but her accuracy was being used for demonic purposes because she was trying to expose them. She wasn't just saying they're men of God. Her, the demon in her was trying to get them in trouble, trying to expose them. But was she accurate? Yes. Was she from God? No. She had the spirit of divination. Now, I, I, I need to illuminate something to you. Some of you may think this is woe, but I need to illuminate something to you because divination still happens. And there are a number of people in a number of nations and in this country who operate and we think they're prophets and it's divination. And we are enamored by the gift of accuracy and God is not in it at all. Divination. Let me, let me show you how deep this spirit is. When I started to, to dive in just a little bit, is this for some of you, you're going to be like, wait, what? I had no idea. Yes. Let's talk about it. Such persons who operated with a heavy spirit of divination typically spoke with their mouths closed. Uttering words considered to be beyond their control, and they were known, listen to this, as ventriloquists. Whenever you see a vaudevillian act or a circus act or something of a ventriloquist, what they're actually doing is they are mimicking the spirit of divination. People who operated in div divination were known throughout the modern world as ventriloquists because they prophesied with their mouths closed. It was that demonic. And we just think it's cool to sit a little puppet on your knee and try to throw our voice and everything else. That's divination. It's, it, it's, a, it's a reenactment of divination. So she was accurate, but Paul was like, uh-uh. Done with you. Now we know why she made the slave girl, made her masters a lot of money because people would come around to see her give them words without opening her mouth. So let's deal. 
Number three, I gave you two. I gave you two, the fruit of their life. And if someone's constantly missing it, um, um, just stay with me for just a moment. I pray this is helping you. Number three, we are to look at doctrine. We are to look at doctrine. What is doctrine? Doctrine is a set of beliefs or specifically a teaching of that set of beliefs. This is what Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. He said, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching or your doctrine. Persist in this for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now, I want to help us. I want to help us with one other item while I'm at this moment. This is what the Spirit of God began to press on my heart. This is the moment for us as a community to really grow. Okay? I want to help us in just a moment. I want to read to you how the writer of the Passion imagines this same passage. But while I'm here, since I'm in uh, an instructive moment, I also want to speak for just a second about the Passion. Hear me. The Passion... uh, What's called the Passion Translation was suggested to me by a person that I greatly love and respect. And so immediately I begin to use uh, and read the Passion. And you know, I encourage many of you to use and read the Passion as well because of the way that it read certain passages of Scripture. But I want to take this moment for just a moment to give you just a slight word of caution here concerning it. And that is this. The Passion, uh, what is called the Passion Translation, well, I'll just call it the Passion, is not considered considered by scholars to be a translation in the sense of biblical accuracy. Okay? It's not, it's, it's an interpretation, but not a translation, and there is a difference. As a companion, it can be used to offer a fresh perspective, but don't use it as your primary translation. Make sure that before you reference it, you've also spent time understanding accurate translations for true meaning. So, so the ESV, uh, the MEV, which is a modern English version of the Bible, which Pastor Jason uh, was, was a, a great part of spearheading that project, the, the, the NASB, New American Standard Bible, uh, the New King James Version, um, even the NLT, those are translations, but the passion is not a translation. All right? So you can use it as a companion, but don't use it as your primary. You got it? But if you have taken time to study the word and not just read it in a cursory way, it's a wonderful companion to give you a different perspective on certain things. So I want to give you a different perspective on 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. This is how the writer of the Passion imagines this particular passage. Give careful attention. Let me also speak to the message as well. Eugene Peterson, who wrote the message, uh, while it's not a translation, it's a transliteration, but there's scholarship behind it. So that's okay. So there's a difference, okay? Even the message, it's not a translation, it's a transliteration, but there was scholarship behind it because Eugene Peterson's considered to be a Bible scholar in that way. All right. Right of the Passion imagines the passage this way. Give careful attention to your spiritual life and every cherished truth that you teach, for living what you preach will then release even more abundant life inside you and to all who listen to you. Live it. So... If point number one was the fruit of their life, some of you may not necessarily be close enough or in proximity or know enough about the individual that you're listening to uh, to know the fruit of their life. You don't know how they act because you only see them on TV. You only see them at a conference. You only see what they post on Instagram. So therefore, you don't necessarily know the fruit of their life. If you don't know the fruit of their life, then watch their doctrine. If you don't know the fruit of the life, watch their doctrine. I'm going way longer than I intended. I'm so sorry. (laughs) All right. What is it? This set of beliefs. The doctrine is a set of beliefs, which means that ultimately what you believe will be revealed by what you teach. How do you watch doctrine? What someone believes will be revealed by what they teach. When I read to us 1 John chapter 4, um, specifically contextually, um, that was written because um, he was talking about false prophets whose doctrine of Christ was wrong. They were denying that Christ, people were denying that Christ came in a real body. And as a result, 
He called them the Antichrist. They were um, um, dabbling in or, or promoting uh, the forerunner to Gnosticism, something called Docicism, which taught that the flesh is evil and the spirit is good, and therefore Christ's spirit could only have taken on flesh for a certain time, if at all. And so they didn't actually believe that Christ was actually in a physical body, so they didn't believe in the incarnation of Christ, and that's what they were teaching, and he called them false prophets or antichrist. That's what he was dealing with. That's why he was so strong to say those who acknowledge that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Context. Number four, I'm almost done. Number four, I'm almost done. Can it be confirmed by scripture? Can it be confirmed by scripture contextually? So we're watching the fruit of their life. If the fruit of their life doesn't match up, you're probably dealing with a false prophet according to Christ in Matthew chapter 7. If they're constantly missing it, you may be dealing with a, a false prophet or a false teacher. Um, that, that was number one. And number two, um, watch their life in their doctrine. If their doctrine will reveal, uh, will ultimately reveal what they believe. And so ultimately, if they are living an incongruent life with doctrine, then that's probably something that you don't want to engage. In number four, can it be confirmed with, by scripture contextually? I'm, I'm going to lean into this word contextually for just a moment. I'm really trying to help us. I did not mean to go this long. I pray this being a blessing to you. Okay, so can it be confirmed by scripture contextually? When you seek to study scripture and not just read it, you'll probably run into two terms hermeneutics and exegesis. An exegesis. Those are probably the two terms that you run into when you're trying to study scripture and not just topically read it. Um, just to, really quickly here, I can't dive too deeply into this, but, but the difference here, hermeneutics is the principle of interpretation. Exegesis is the act of studying a passage critically and objectively and interpreting the meaning. The two terms, hermeneutics and exegesis, are sometimes used almost interchangeably, but there is a subtle difference. The simplest explanation between the differences of hermeneutics and exegesis. The hermeneutics is the principle or the lens of interpretation, while exegesis is the act of studying the passage critically and objectively for interpreting the meaning. Family, hear me. This is, you're like, okay, hermeneutics, exegesis, I don't know all about that. It's like to read the Bible and say, God, tell me what to do. <laughs> But I want to help you because this is vitally important because we are in a moment right now where we need to be able to accurately discern false prophets and false teachers. Even if you are not consciously aware, everyone approaches scripture with a hermeneutic of some sort. Yeah. But a, 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 a principle of interpretation. The goal of hermeneutics is not to look at the Bible with a subjective or tainted lens as a person might do when they approach the Bible on their own, but to try to discern what the intended meaning of the passage is, whether for the readers at that time or written for us today. There are three types of hermeneutics that most people use. I won't go into them now. Literal, moral, or allegorical, which is the combination of literal and moral. Uh, we can deal with that at another time. Pastor Matt and Pastor Jason can probably do a wonderful exposition on everything I just said. This is how you apply it. Assume that the scripture says what it means. Remember, we're talking about can what someone says be proven in scripture contextually. This is very important. I could have made this point number one. Okay. Assume that the scripture says what it means. What was the historical context, meaning who wrote it? Who were they writing to, if anyone? Why? What was the cultural context and what was going on at that time? Interpret the passage within the context of the Bible itself. These are some of the ways that we begin to, I, I know that, you know, if, if you're new to this, you're probably not thinking all of this when you're hearing somebody preach, but the, the more you study the scripture, when you hear stuff, it's going through all of those lens uh, in a subconscious way very rapidly. Okay, that's one of the, when, when we study the scripture, when someone says something, they don't just say it in isolation. When you begin to train your mind to see the scripture properly, it runs through all of those lens very quickly within seconds. So what I'm saying may seem like, well, I, how, how do I do all that? Listen, train yourself to study the scripture. And then when you hear somebody else preaching immediately, that's how your spirit man will know. Uh, -uh. It's not just a sense. It's how we've trained ourselves. As the scripture says, train yourself to be godly. Pastor Caleb's always helping me preach. I love it. <laughs> 
how it's in the context of the Bible itself, what verses preceded and followed the pass the passage, what the passage as a whole is about, what is, what is the book about, and is it referencing a different part of Scripture? So the simplest explanation of the difference is that exegesis is the act of studying a passage critically and objectively and interpreting the meaning. There's a whole reason why I brought all of that up. That may have seemed like, okay, you're taking too long, Pastor. You lost us. We get it. Don't follow false people. I get it. Stay with me. There's a reason why I said what I said about that. Because there is another term that unfortunately many of us have experienced if we grew up in charismatic and Pentecostal settings. And that is the term eisegesis. You probably never, maybe some of you have never heard that term before, but you have probably experienced it if you grew up in charismatic or Pentecostal settings. It's actually one of the reasons why mainline denominations and Reformed theologians and things like that look at the charismatic movement and say, y'all don't know the Bible because there's a lot of eisegesis going on. What is eisegesis? Eisegesis is approaching the text with a preconceived idea. Basically, having an idea and searching for a passage to support your thought. Which is to say, God told me X, Y, Z, and so I'm going to go find ABC to support X, Y, Z. We have a whole lot of people approaching the scripture that way, teaching the scripture that way. And because they approach and teach the scripture that way, if you find people who are operating uh, all the time with eisegesis, which is God said to me, God said to me, God said to me, and then they go to the scripture to prove that God said it to them, run from those people. I'm being honest with you. I'm being honest with you because there's a lot of that in our context. Someone engaged in exegetical study comes to conclusions based on careful, objective analysis of a text. Someone who engages in eisegesis approaches the text with a preconceived idea and attempts to find passages and interpret a text to support what they claim. Taken out of context, it's possible to justify terrible things with the Bible. The Bible contains records of good and evil people. And it's also easy to completely miss the point of a passage to try to make it say whatever you want. Family, when I begin to grow in scripture, so because I grew up in a context of, of charismatic Pentecostalism, when, when I really began to study the scripture for myself, I discovered very quickly that there were a number of passages that I thought they meant one thing. And when I studied them for real, they mean something completely different. Not slightly different, completely different, which caused me to understand that for many years I sat under error. I'll never forget, I was talking to a pastor, I, I, I put no anecdotes in my, my message this moment because I didn't want to go too long and now I'm going long anyway, it's, it's horrible. <laughs> Somebody just say, let's go deeper. And then we're going to go deeper than that in a little bit. <laughs> but, but have your appetite. All right, we're going to get the word today. All right. So <laughs> we're really going to get it. <laughs> um, I, I, I never forget. Um, I, I study and I study and I study and I study because I don't want to get things wrong. And I don't want to teach you wrong. And I don't want to lead you wrong. And, and all of us who preach the word to you deeper, we feel the weight of the word and we don't want to say something that's off or wrong or, or whatever. And so we, we study. Now, I, I'm a better communicator than I was years ago. I recognize my own growth. Um, I look back at some of the messages I preached to you early on on and I'm just like, oh, thank God for grace and everything else because I understood I didn't um, have the, 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 the lens that I have now. One of the reasons why I'm so grateful for the original 15 is because they stayed through my growth. Yeah. They didn't just come when I'm like this now. They, they let me work it out in front of them. As I moved from worship leader to lead pastor, they stayed and I'm grateful. Because they could have been like, mm, I think I need somebody a little bit more experienced and seasoned than that. But they stayed anyway. So I'm grateful for y'all. But I remember saying to a pastor, I was like, I, I just don't want to, I don't want to error. And he was the one, he was like, you will never error. And I was like, what are you talking about? I'll never error. I miss it all the time. And that's when he reminded me, remember, error is a spirit. It's an intentional misleading. Eisegesis flirts with error. 
I want to give us a simple, easy, non-controversial example. There are scriptures that are challenging. There are scriptures that are um, difficult. Um, I don't want to give you a challenging or difficult passage to wrestle with in this moment. I want to give you a simple one to show you the difference. This is, this is really simple. You could probably say, hey, we can apply the same principle. I get it, but I just want to show you the difference really quickly, and I promise you I'm almost done. That's not just a preacher lie, for real, okay? We hear a verse like Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, quoted a lot. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, if we use that with the lens of eisegesis, what typically happens is we'll see that in sports, um, uh, inspirational posters, things like that, as if it's a promise that we can do anything. We can run through walls. We can take down our opponent. We can do all this kind of stuff. And that's the way to, I can do all things through Christ. Like I, it's, it's, a, it's like this, 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 this intimidation. Like I can just do anything. I can bust through this wall if I want to. And, and we use that and we're like, I can do all things through Christ that gives us strength. That is an eisegesis lens. Because contextually, if you looked at it exegetically, you would discover that that particular verse is used as an example of faith in enduring trials. That's right. That's right. That verse, Paul is talking about how he has been poor and how he's been rich and how he has learned the secret that faith in Christ allows him to endure anything in faith. That's right. It's not just... I'm a boxer and I'm about to beat you up. It's I can endure through faith. I've learned the secret that faith in Christ allows me to endure whether I'm up or I'm down, I'm rich or I'm poor. It gives me the faith to endure trials. Exegesis, which causes us to see contextually what it means, not just isolating it for our own purposes. This is my last point. Does it glorify Jesus? Does it glorify Jesus? Revelation 19.10, most of you know it well. The spirit of prophecy is a testimony of Jesus, or the essence of prophecy is to give a clear witness for Jesus. Everything that is prophetic or everything that is taught should ultimately point to Christ. Prophecy should never take our focus away from Christ. Anything that does is leading you into idolatry, no matter how powerful it seems. You could play. I, I, I want to show you this last scripture, this last scripture right here in this same point. Does it glorify Jesus? Does it point to, does it glorify Jesus? Because um, a lot of particularly um, in, in our charismatic Pentecostal circles, and, and I, I don't want to be... Uh, too bad because I know that it exists on all sides, but uh, in, the, in the ethnic circles, we kind of exalt the gift of prophecy above everything else, especially if someone operates in word of knowledge or word of wisdom, which I didn't even go down the path of the fact that that also doesn't make you a prophet. Every prophet has the gift of word of knowledge, but not every person that has the gift of word of knowledge is a prophet. <laughs> So when someone says, I sense there's somebody in the room named Susan, that's not a prophet. That's somebody with the gift of word of knowledge. A prophet is someone who stands in the council to hear the secrets of heaven that brings to bear the mind and the heart of God for an entire situation, people, or nation. There is a difference. Uh, you, you, you see me quite a bit operating in word of knowledge. That doesn't mean that just because I can hear God in one sense that suddenly I'm hearing God in all senses. Now, there is a, a prophetic thing with me, <laughs> but not every person who operates in word of knowledge is a prophet, although every prophet operates in word of knowledge. You're understanding? I want to point this out to you because I wanted to be clear to you, and I, I went down the lane of kind of how we exalt things in an ethnic way, um, and I know that it happens everywhere. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not zeroing in or focusing on one group. But one of the things that happens 
to us a lot is when someone, particularly someone who operates in an extreme gift of word of knowledge, we, we become sign hungry. We become so sign hungry that we will follow them to the ends of the earth because of the accuracy of their gift. Not understanding that it's possible that they're leading you away from Christ because there's a lot of people who operate in that particular gift that don't point to Christ. Here's the last scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1 is my last scripture. Thank you for your patience. I promise you with everything in me. <laughs> I originally told our people this would take 15 minutes. <laughs> Suppose there are prophets among you or those who dream dreams about the future and they promise you signs or miracles and the predicted signs or miracles occur. If they then say, come, let us worship other gods, gods you have not known before, do not listen to them. Are you seeing this family? They said a sign or, or, or a miracle would happen and it did. But then now that they have your attention, they're saying, come, let us serve other gods. Now you may say, no one has asked me to go serve Baal. How about this? Come, let us serve mammon. Come, let us serve prosperity. Come. Now that you've seen my gift, so into it. Now that you've seen how I operate, send me your money. Send me your prayer requests. That's another God. Do not listen to them. The Lord your God is testing you to see if you truly love him with all your heart and soul. Serve, the, serve only the Lord your God and fear him alone. Obey his commands, listen to his voice and cling to him. The false prophets or visionaries who try to lead you astray must be put to death. Again, thank God. <laughs> or perhaps if I were to take a modern day lens to this, put to death in your mind. I'm not following them. I'm not listening to them. For they encourage rebellion against the Lord your God who redeemed you from slavery and brought you out of the land of Egypt. Since they try to lead you astray from the way the Lord your God commanded you to live, you must put them to death. In this way, you will purge the evil from among you. Just because the gift works does not mean you should follow them if they don't point you to Christ. Does it glorify God? I hope you got those five points. I'm finished. And I hope that you're hungry enough to hear more word. Because I needed us in a moment of hypersensitivity and a lot of talk about what's true and false for us to understand, number one, what's true and false, and then who we should be listening to and not listening to. If you're not putting them through these lens, you are open to the spirit of deception. So remember, the wanderer that the Spirit of God broke our hearts for last week caused us to repent for cancel culture is those who have been drawn away into deception have compassion for them. For those who are the purveyors of deception, that's not the wanderer. You understand? We're not to go after the purveyor of deception. We are to confront them. But for those who've been drawn away, we are to have compassion. This is why it's important that we don't cancel everybody. But I also want to help us understand as a family how we are to operate moving forward. Father, I pray that you would take these words of mine. While I know it's not completely exhaustive, I know it's what you gave to me to give to our people in a pastoral moment. I pray that they receive these words, they apply these words, and that you protect them from the spirit of deception that's in the land. In Jesus' name, amen.